disc 13. Her mind felt as though it had rolled over within her. She recognized the sensation with a quickening of pulse. Nothing in all the Bene Gesserit training carried such a signal of recognition. It could be only the Adab, the demanding memory that comes upon you of itself. She gave herself up to it, allowing the words to flow from her. Ibn Kirtayiba, she said, as far as the spot where the dust ends. She stretched out an arm from her robe, seeing Stilgar's eyes go wide. She heard a rustling of many robes in the background. I see a Fremen with the Book of Examples, she intoned. He reads to Allah, the son whom he defied and subjugated. He reads to the Sadhus of the trial, and this is what he reads. Mine enemies are like green blades beaten down that did stand in the path of the tempest. Hast thou not seen what our Lord did? He sent the pestilence among them that did lay schemes against us. They are like birds scattered by the huntsmen. Their schemes are like pellets of poison that every mouth rejects. A trembling passed through her. She dropped her arm. Back to her from the inner cave's shadows came a whispered response of many voices. Their works have been overturned. The fire of God mount over thy heart, she said. And she thought, now it goes in the proper channel. The fire of God set alight, came the response. She nodded. Thine enemies shall fall, she said. Bilal Kaifa, they answered. In the sudden hush, Stilgar bowed to her. Sayadina, he said, if the Shayalud grant, then you may yet pass within to become a reverend mother. Pass within, she thought. An odd way of putting it. But the rest of it fitted into the camp well enough and she felt a cynical bitterness at what she had done. Our missionaria protectiva seldom fails. A place was prepared for us in this wilderness. The prayer of the Salat has carved out our hiding place. Now, I must play the part of Olia, the friend of God. Sayadina to rogue peoples who've been so heavily imprinted with our Bene Gesserit soothsay. They even call their chief priestesses reverend mothers. Paul stood beside Cheney in the shadows of the inner cave. He could still taste the morsel she had fed him. Bird flesh and grain bound with spice honey and encased in a leaf. In tasting it, he had realized he never before had eaten such a concentration of spice essence, and there had been a moment of fear. He knew what this essence could do to him. The spice change that pushed his mind into prescient awareness. Be la Kaifa, Cheney whispered. He looked at her, seeing the awe with which the Fremen appeared to accept his mother's words. Only the man called Jamis seemed to stand aloof from the ceremony, holding himself apart with arms folded across his breast. Do we yaka in manje, Cheney whispered. Do we punra in manje? I have two eyes. I have two feet. And she stared at Paul with a look of wonder. Paul took a deep breath, trying to still the tempest within him. His mother's words had locked onto the working of the spice essence, and he had felt her voice rise and fall within him like the shadows of an open fire. Through it all, he had sensed the edge of cynicism in her. He knew her so well, but nothing could stop this thing that had begun with a morsel of food. Terrible purpose. He sensed it, the race consciousness that he could not escape. There was the sharpened clarity, the inflow of data, the cold precision of his awareness. He sank to the floor, sitting with his back against rock giving himself up to it. 
Awareness flowed into that timeless stratum where he could view time, sensing the available paths, the winds of the future, the winds of the past, the one-eyed vision of the past, the one-eyed vision of the present, and the one-eyed vision of the future, all combined in a trinocular vision that permitted him to see time become space. There was danger, he felt, of overrunning himself, and he had to hold on to his awareness of the present, sensing the blurred deflection of experience, the flowing moment, the continual solidification of that which is into the perpetual was. In grasping the present, he felt for the first time the massive steadiness of time's movement everywhere, complicated by shifting currents, waves, surges, and countersurges, like surf against rocky cliffs. It gave him a new understanding of his prescience, and he saw the source of blind time, the source of error in it, with an immediate sensation of fear. The prescience, he realized, was an illumination that incorporated the limits of what it revealed, at once a source of accuracy and meaningful error. A kind of Heisenberg indeterminacy intervened, the expenditure of energy that revealed what he saw changed what he saw. And what he saw was a time nexus within this cave, a boiling of possibilities focused here, wherein the most minute action, the wink of an eye, the careless word, a misplaced grain of sand, moved a gigantic lever across the known universe, he saw violence with the outcome subject to so many variables that his slightest movement created vast shiftings in the pattern. The vision made him want to freeze into immobility, but this, too, was action with its consequences. The countless consequences. Lines fanned out from this cave, and along most of these consequence lines he saw his own dead body, with blood flowing from a gaping knife wound. My father, the Padishah Emperor, was seventy-two, yet looked no more than thirty-five the year he encompassed the death of Duke Leto and gave Arrakis back to the Harkonnens. He seldom appeared in public wearing other than a Sardaukar uniform and a Berseg's black helmet with the Imperial Lion in gold upon its crest. The uniform was an open reminder of where his power lay. He was not always that blatant, though. When he wanted, he could radiate charm and sincerity. But I often wonder in these later days if anything about him was as it seemed. I think now he was a man fighting constantly to escape the bars of an invisible cage. You must remember that he was an emperor father head of a dynasty that reached back into the dimmest history. But we denied him a legal son. Was this not the most terrible defeat a ruler ever suffered? My mother obeyed her sister's superiors where the Lady Jessica disobeyed. Which of them was the stronger? History already has answered. In My Father's House, by the Princess Irulan. Jessica awakened in cave darkness, sensing the stir of Fremen around her, smelling the acrid, still-suit odor. Her inner time sense told her it would soon be night outside, but the cave remained in blackness, shielded from the desert by the plastic hoods that trapped their body moisture within this space. She realized that she had permitted herself the utterly relaxing sleep of great fatigue, and this suggested something of her own unconscious assessment on personal security within Stilgar's troop. She turned in the hammock that had been fashioned of her robe, slipped her feet to the rock floor and into her desert boots. I must remember to fasten the boots slip fashion to help my still suit's pumping action, she thought. There are so many things to remember. She could still taste their morning meal, the morsel of bird flesh and grain bound within a leaf with spice honey, 
And it came to her that the use of time was turned around here. Night was the day of activity, and day was the time of rest. Night conceals. Night is safest. She unhooked her robe from its hammock pegs in a rock alcove, fumbled with the fabric in the dark until she found the top, slipped into it. How to get a message out to the Bene Gesserit, she wondered. They would have to be told of the two strays in Erekin's sanctuary. Glow globes came alight farther into the cave. She saw people moving there, Paul among them already dressed and with his hood thrown back to reveal the aquiline Atreides profile. He had acted so strangely before they retired, she thought. Withdrawn. He was like one come back from the dead, not yet fully aware of his return his eyes half-shut and glassy with the inward stare. It made her think of his warning about the spice-impregnated diet. Addictive. Are there side effects, she wondered. He said it had something to do with his prescient faculty. But he has been strangely silent about what he sees. Stilgar came from shadows to her right, crossed to the group beneath the glow globes. She marked how he fingered his beard and the watchful, cat-stalking look of him. Abrupt fear shot through Jessica as her senses awakened to the tensions visible in the people gathered around Paul. The stiff movements? The ritual positions? They have my countenance, Stilgar rumbled. Jessica recognized the man Stilgar confronted. Jameis. She saw then the rage in Jameis, the tight set of his shoulders. Jameis, the man Paul bested, she thought. You know the rules, Stilgar, Jameis said. Who knows it better, Stilgar asked, and she heard the tone of placation in his voice, the attempt to smooth something over. I choose the combat, Jameis growled. Jessica sped across the cave, grasped Stilgar's arm. What is this? she asked. It is the Amtal rule, Stilgar said. Jameis is demanding the right to test your part in the legend. She must be championed, Jameis said. If her champion wins, that's the truth in it. But it's said. He glanced across the press of people that she'd need no champion from the Fremen, which can mean only that she brings her own champion. He's talking of single combat with Paul, Jessica thought. She released Stilgar's arm, took a half-step forward. I'm always my own champion, she said. The meaning's simple enough, but you'll not tell us our ways, Jameis snapped. Not without more proof than I've seen. Stilgar could have told you what to say last morning. He could have filled your mind full of the coddle, and you could have bird-talked it to us, hoping to make a false way among us. I can take him, Jessica thought. But that might conflict with the way they interpret the legend. And again she wondered at the way the Missionaria Protectiva's work had been twisted on this planet. Stilgar looked at Jessica spoke in a low voice, but one designed to carry to the crowd's fringe. Jameis is one to hold a grudge, Sayadina. Your son bested him, and it was an accident, Jameis roared. There was witch force at Tuono Basin, and I'll prove it now. And I've bested him myself, Stilgar continued. He seeks by this Tahadi challenge to get back at me as well. There's too much of violence in Jameis for him ever to make a good leader. Too much Gathla, the distraction. He gives his mouth to the rules and his heart to the Sarfa. The turning away. No, he could never make a good leader. I've preserved him this long because he's useful in a fight as such. But when he gets this carving anger on him, he's dangerous to his own society. Stilgar, Jameis rumbled. 
and Jessica saw what Stilgar was doing, trying to enrage Janus, to take the challenge away from Paul. Stilgar faced Jameis, and again Jessica heard the soothing in the rumbling voice. Jameis, he's but a boy. He's... You named him a man, Jameis said. His mother says he's been through the Gom Jabbar. He's full-fleshed and with a surfeit of water. The ones who carried their pack say there's liter johns of water in it. Liter johns. And us... "'sipping our catch pockets the instant they showed dew sparkle. "'Stilgar glanced at Jessica. "'Is this true? "'Is there water in your pack?' "'Yes. "'Lether John's of it. Two Lether John's. "'What was intended with his wealth?' "'Wealth?' she thought. "'She shook her head, feeling the coldness in his voice.' Where I was born, water fell from the sky and ran over the land in wide rivers, she said. There were oceans of it so broad you could not see the other shore. I've not been trained to your water discipline. I never before had to think of it this way. A sighing gasp arose from the people around them. Water fell from the sky. It ran over the land. Did you know there are those among us who've lost from their catch pockets by accident and will be in sore trouble before we reach Tabura this night? How could I know? Jessica shook her head. If they're in need, give them water from our pack. Is that what you intended with this wealth? I intended it to save life, she said. Then we accept your blessing, Sayadina. You'll not buy us off with water, Jameis growled. Nor will you anger me against yourself, Stilgar. I see you trying to make me call you out before I've proved my words. Stilgar faced Jameis. Are you determined to press this fight against a child, Jameis? His voice was low, venomous. She must be championed. Even though she has my countenance. I invoke the Amtal rule, Janus said. It's my right. Stilgar nodded. Then, if the boy does not carve you down, you'll answer to my knife afterward. And this time, I'll not hold back the blade as I've done before. You cannot do this thing, Jessica said. Holes, just... You must not interfere, Sayadina, Stilgar said. Oh, I know you can take me, and therefore can take anyone among us, but you cannot best us all united. This must be. It is the Amtal rule. Jessica fell silent, staring at him in the green light of the glow globes, seeing the demoniacal stiffness that had taken over his expression. She shifted her attention to Jameis, saw the brooding look to his brows, and thought, I should have seen that before. He broods. He's the silent kind, one who works himself up inside. I should have been prepared. If you harm my son, she said, you'll have me to meet. I call you out now. I'll carve you into a joint of... Mother. Paul stepped forward, touched her sleeve. Perhaps if I explain to Jameis how... Explain, Jameis sneered. Paul fell silent, staring at the man. He felt no fear of him. Jameis appeared clumsy in his movements, and he had fallen so easily in their night encounter on the sand. But Paul still felt the nexus boiling of this cave still remembered the prescient visions of himself dead under a knife. There had been so few avenues of escape for him in that vision. Stilgar said, Sayadina, you must step back now. Where Stop calling her Sayadina, James said. That's yet to be proved. 
So she knows the prayer. What's that? Every child among us knows it. He has talked enough, Jaskathon. I have the key to him. I could immobilize him with a word. She hesitated. But I cannot stop them all. You will answer to me then, Jessica said, and she pitched her voice in a twisting tone with a little whining and a catch at the end. Jameis stared at her, fright visible on his face. I'll teach you agony, she said in the same tone. Remember that as you fight. You will have agonies such as will make the Gom Jabbar a happy memory by comparison. You will ride with your entire... She tries a spell on me, Jameis gasped. He put his clenched right fist beside his ear. I invoke the silence on her. So be it then, Stilgar said. He cast a warning glance at Jessica. If you speak again, Sayadina, we'll know it's your witchcraft, and you'll be forfeit. He nodded for her to step back. Jessica felt hands pulling her, helping her back, and she sensed they were not unkindly. She saw Paul being separated from the throng, the elfin-faced Cheney whispering in his ear as she nodded toward Jameis. A ring formed within the troop. More glow globes were brought, and all of them tuned to the yellow band. Jameis stepped into the ring, slipped out of his robe and tossed it to someone in the crowd. He stood there in a cloudy gray slickness of still suit that was patched and marked by tucks and gathers. For a moment, he bent with his mouth to his shoulder, drinking from a catch pocket tube. Presently, he straightened, peeled off, and detached the suit, handed it carefully into the crowd. He stood waiting, clad in loincloth and some tight fabric over his feet, a chris knife in his right hand. Jessica saw the girl child Cheney helping Paul, saw her press a chris knife handle into his palm saw him heft it, testing the weight and balance. And it came to Jessica that Paul had been trained in prana and bindu, the nerve and the fiber, that he had been taught fighting in a deadly school, his teacher's men like Duncan Idaho and Gurney Halleck, men who were legends in their own lifetimes. The boy knew the devious ways of the Bene Gesserit, and he looked supple and confident. But he's only fifteen, she thought. And he has no shield. I must stop this. Somehow there must be a way to... She looked up, saw Stilgar watching her. You cannot stop it, he said. You must not speak. She put a hand over her mouth, thinking, I've planted fear in James's mind. It'll slow him some. Perhaps, if I could only pray, truly pray. Paul stood alone now, just into the ring, clad in the fighting trunks he'd worn under his still suit. He held the chris knife in his right hand. His feet were bare against the sand-gritted rock. Idaho had warned him time and again, when in doubt of your surface, bare feet are best. And there were Cheney's words of instruction still in the front of his consciousness. Jameis turns to the right with his knife after a parry. It's a habit in him we've all seen. And he'll aim for the eyes to catch a blink in which to slash you. And he can fight either hand. Look out for a knife shift. But strongest in Paul, so that he felt it with his entire body, was training and the instinctual reaction mechanism that had been hammered into him day after day, hour after hour on the practice floor. Gurney Halleck's words were there to remember. The good knife fighter thinks on points and blade and shearing guards simultaneously. The point can also cut. The blade can also stab. The shearing guard can also trap your opponent's blade. 
Paul glanced at Chris Knight. There was no shearing bar, only the slim, round ring of the handle with its raised lips to protect the hand. And even so, he realized that he did not know the breaking tension of this blade, did not even know if it could be broken. Jameis began sidling to the right along the edge of the ring opposite Paul. Paul crouched, realizing then that he had no shield, but was trained to fighting with its subtle field around him, trained to react on defense with utmost speed, while his attack would be timed to the controlled slowness necessary for penetrating the enemy's shield. In spite of constant warning from his trainers not to depend on the shield's mindless blunting of attack speed, he knew that shield awareness was part of him. Jameis called out in ritual challenge, May thy knife chip and shatter. This knife will break then, Paul thought. He cautioned himself that Jameis also was without shield, but the man wasn't trained to its use, had no shield fighter inhibitions. Paul stared across the ring at Jameis. The man's body looked like knotted whipcord on a dried skeleton. His Chris knife shone milky yellow in the light of the glow globes. Fear coursed through Paul. He felt suddenly alone and naked, standing in dull yellow light within this ring of people. Prescience had fed his knowledge with countless experiences, hinted at the strongest currents of the future and the strings of decision that guided them. But this was the real now. This was death hanging on an infinite number of minuscule mischances. Anything could tip the future here, he realized. Someone coughing in the troop of watchers, a distraction, a variation in a glow globe's brilliance, a deceptive shadow. I'm afraid, Paul told himself. And he circled warily opposite Jameis repeating silently to himself the Bene Gesserit litany against fear. Fear is the mind killer. It was a cool bath washing over him. He felt muscles untie themselves, become poised and ready. I'll sheathe my knife in your blood, Jameis snarled. And in the middle of the last word, he pounced. Jessica saw the motion, stifled an outcry. Where the man struck, there was only empty air, and Paul stood now behind Jameis with a clear shot at the exposed back. Now, Paul, now! Jessica screamed it in her mind. Paul's motion was slowly timed, beautifully fluid, but so slow it gave Jameis the margin to twist away, backing and turning to the right. Paul withdrew crouching low. First, you must find my blood, he said. Jessica recognized the shield fighter timing in her son, and it came over her what a two-edged thing that was. The boy's reactions were those of youth, and trained to a peak these people had never seen. But the attack was trained, too, and conditioned by the necessities of penetrating a shield barrier. A shield would repel too fast a blow, admit only the slowly deceptive counter. It needed control and trickery to get through a shield. Does Paul see it? she asked herself. He must. Again Jameis attacked, ink-dark eyes glaring, his body a yellow blur under the glow globes. And again Paul slipped away to return too slowly on the attack. And again... And again. Each time Paul's counterblow came an instant late. And Jessica saw a thing she hoped Jameis did not see. Paul's defensive reactions were blindingly fast, but they moved each time at the precisely correct angle they would take if a shield were helping deflect part of Jameis's blow. Is your son playing with that poor fool? Stilgar asked. He waved her to silence before she could respond. Sorry. You must remain silent. Now the two figures on the rock floor circled each other. 
Jameis, with knife hand held far forward and tipped up slightly. Paul crouched with knife held low. Again, Jameis pounced, and this time he twisted to the right where Paul had been dodging. Instead of faking back and out, Paul met the man's knife hand on the point of his own blade. Then the boy was gone, twisting away to the left and thankful for Cheney's warning. Jameis backed into the center of the circle, rubbing his knife hand. Blood dripped from the injury for a moment, stopped. His eyes were wide and staring, two blue-black holes, studying Paul with a new wariness in the dull light of the glow globes. Ah, oh, that one hurts, Stilgar murmured. Paul crouched at the ready, and as he had been trained to do after first blood, called out, Do you yield? Ha! Jameis cried. An angry murmur arose from the troop. Hold! Stilgar called out. The lad doesn't know our rule. Then, to Paul, There can be no yielding in the Tahadi challenge. Death is the test of it. Jessica saw Paul swallow hard, and she thought, He's never killed a man like this, in the hot blood of a knife fight. Can he do it? Paul circled slowly right, forced by Jameis's movement. The prescient knowledge of the time-boiling variables in this cave came back to plague him now. His new understanding told him there were too many swiftly compressed decisions in this fight for any clear channel ahead to show itself. Variable piled on variable. That was why this cave lay as a blurred nexus in his path. It was like a gigantic rock in the flood, creating maelstroms in the current around it. Have an end to it, lad, Stilgar muttered. Don't play with him. Paul crept farther into the ring, relying on his own edge in speed. Jameis back, now that the realization swept over him. But this was no soft off-worlder in the Tahadi ring, easy prey for a Fremen Chrisknife. Jessica saw the shadow of desperation in the man's face. Now is when he's most dangerous, she thought. Now he's desperate and can do anything. He sees that this is not like a child of his own people, but a fighting machine born and trained to it from infancy. Now the fear I planted in him has come to bloom. And she found in herself a sense of pity for Jameis, an emotion tempered by awareness of the immediate peril to her son. Jameis could do anything. Any unpredictable thing, she told herself. She wondered then if Paul had glimpsed this future, if he were reliving this experience. But she saw the way her son moved, the beads of perspiration on his face and shoulders, the careful wariness visible in the flow of muscles. And for the first time, she sensed, without understanding it, the uncertainty factor in Paul's gift. Paul pressed the fight now, circling but not attacking. He had seen the fear in his opponent. Memory of Duncan Idaho's voice flowed through Paul's awareness. When your opponent fears you, then's the moment when you give the fear its own reign. Give it the time to work on him. Let it become terror. The terrified man fights himself. Eventually he attacks in desperation. That is the most dangerous moment, but the terrified man can be trusted usually to make a fatal mistake. You are being trained here to detect these mistakes and use them. The crowd in the cavern began to mutter. They think Paul's toying with Janus, Jessica thought. They think Paul's being needlessly cruel but she sensed also the undercurrent of crowd excitement, their enjoyment of the spectacle. And she could see the pressure building up in Jameis. The moment when it became too much for him to contain was as apparent to her as it was to Jameis. Or, 
to Paul. Jamus leaped high, fainting and striking down with his right hand, but the hand was empty. The Chris knife had been shifted to his left hand. Jessica gasped. But Paul had been warned by Cheney. Jameis fights with either hand, and the depth of his training had taken in that trick on Passant. Keep the mind on the knife, and not on the hand that holds it, Gurney Halleck had told him time and again. The knife is more dangerous than the hand, and the knife can be in either hand. And Paul had seen Jameis's mistake. Bad footwork so that it took the man a heartbeat longer to recover from his leap, which had been intended to confuse Paul and hide the knife shift. Except for the low yellow light of the glow globes and the inky eyes of the staring troop, it was similar to a session on the practice floor. Shields didn't count where the body's own movement could be used against it. Paul shifted his own knife in a blurred motion slipped sideways and thrust upward where Jameis's chest was descending, then away to watch the man crumble. Jameis fell like a limp rag, face down, gasped once and turned his face toward Paul, then lay still on the rock floor. His dead eyes stared out like beads of dark glass, Killing with the point lacks artistry, Idaho had once told Paul. But don't let that hold your hand when the opening presents itself. The troop rushed forward, filling the ring, pushing Paul aside. They hid Jameis in a frenzy of huddling activity. Presently, a group of them hurried back into the depths of the cavern, carrying a burden wrapped in a robe. And there was no body on the rock floor. Jessica pressed through toward her son. She felt that she swam in a sea of robed and stinking backs, a throng strangely silent. Now is the terrible moment, she thought. He has killed a man in clear superiority of mind and muscle. He must not grow to enjoy such a victory. She forced herself through the last of the troop and into a small open space, where two bearded Fremen were helping Paul into his still suit. Jessica stared at her son. Paul's eyes were bright. He breathed heavily, permitting the ministrations to his body rather than helping them. Him against Jameis and not a mark on him, one of the men muttered. Cheney stood at one side, her eyes focused on Paul. Jessica saw the girl's excitement. The admiration in the elfin face. It must be done now and swiftly, Jessica thought. She compressed ultimate scorn into her voice and manner, said, Well, now, how does it feel to be a killer? Paul stiffened as though he had been struck. He met his mother's cold glare and his face darkened with a rush of blood. Involuntarily, he glanced toward the place on the cavern floor where Jameis had lain. Stilgar pressed through to Jessica's side, returning from the cave depths where the body of Jameis had been taken. He spoke to Paul in a bitter, controlled tone. When the time comes for you to call me out and try for my burden, do not think you will play with me the way you played with Jameis. Jessica sensed the way her own words and Stilgar's sank into Paul, doing their harsh work on the boy. The mistake these people made. It served a purpose now. She searched the faces around them as Paul was doing, seeing what he saw. Admiration, yes, and fear, and in some, loathing. She looked at Stilgar saw his fatalism, knew how the fight had seemed to him. Paul looked at his mother. You know what it was, he said. She heard the return to sanity, the remorse in his voice. Jessica swept her glance across the troop, said, Paul has never before killed a man with a naked blade. Stilgar faced her, 
disbelief in his face. I wasn't playing with him, Paul said. He pressed in front of his mother, straightening his robe, glanced at the dark place of Jameis's blood on the cavern floor. I did not want to kill him. Jessica saw belief come slowly to Stilgar, saw the relief in him as he tugged at his beard with a deeply veined hand. She heard muttering awareness spread through the troop. That's why you asked him to yield, Stilgar said. I see. Our ways are different, but you'll see the sense in them. I thought we'd admitted a scorpion into our midst. He hesitated, then, and I shall not call you lad the more. A voice from the troop called out, Needs a naming still. Stilgar nodded, tugging at his beard. I see strength in you, like the strength beneath a pillar. Again he paused, then, You shall be known among us as Usul. The base of the pillar. This is your secret name, your troop name. We of C.H. Tabur may use it, but none other may so presume. Uso. Murmuring went through the troop. Good choice, that. Strong. Bring us luck. And Jessica sensed the acceptance knowing she was included in it with her champion. She was indeed Sayadina. Now, what name of manhood do you choose for us to call you openly? Stilgar asked. Paul glanced at his mother, back to Stilgar. Bits and pieces of this moment registered on his prescient memory, but he felt the differences as though they were physical. A pressure forcing him through the narrow door of the present. How do you call among you the little mouse? The mouse that jumps, Paul asked, remembering the pop-hop of motion at Tuono Basin. He illustrated with one hand. A chuckle sounded through the troop. We call that one Muad'Dib, Stilgar said. Jessica gasped. It was the name Paul had told her, saying that the Fremen would accept them and call him thus. She felt a sudden fear of her son and for him. Paul swallowed. He felt that he played a part already played over countless times in his head. Yet there were differences. He could see himself perched on a dizzying summit, having experienced much and possessed of a profound store of knowledge. But all around him was abyss. And again he remembered the vision of fanatic legions following the green and black banner of the Atreides, pillaging and burning across the universe in the name of their prophet Muad'Dib. That must not happen, he told himself. Is that the name you wish, Mordi? Stilgar asked. I am an Atreides, Paul whispered. And then louder, it's not right that I give up entirely the name my father gave me. Could I be known among you as Paul Mordib? You are Paul Mordib, Stilgar said. And Paul thought... That was in no vision of mine. I did a different thing. But he felt that the abyss remained all around him. Again, a murmuring response went through the troop as man turned to man. Wisdom with strength. Couldn't ask more. It's the legend for sure. Lizan al-Gaib. Lizan al-Gaib. I will tell you a thing about your new name, Stilgar said. The choice pleases us. Muad'Dib is wise in the ways of the desert. Muad'Dib 
creates his own water. Muad'Dib hides from the sun and travels in the cool night. Muad'Dib is fruitful and multiplies over the land. Muad'Dib, we call instructor of boys. That is a powerful base on which to build your life, Paul Muad'Dib, who is Usul among us. We welcome you. Stilgar touched Paul's forehead with one palm, withdrew his hand, embraced Paul, and murmured, Usul. As Stilgar released him, another member of the troop embraced Paul, repeating his new troop name. And Paul was passed from embrace to embrace through the troop, hearing the voices, the shadings of tone. Usul. 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 Already he could place some of them by name. And there was Janie, who pressed her cheek against his as she held him and said his name. Presently Paul stood again before Stilgar, who said, Now you are of the Ichwan Bedouin, our brother. His face hardened, and he spoke with command in his voice. And now, Paul Mwadib, tighten up that still suit. He glanced at Cheney. Cheney, Paul Mwadib's nose plugs are as poor a fit I've ever seen. I thought I ordered you to see after him. I hadn't the makings still, she said. There's Jameis's, of course, but enough of that. Then I'll share one of mine, she said. I can make do with one until... You will not, Stilgar said. I know there are spares among us. Where are the spares? Are we a troop together or a band of savages? Hands reached out from the troop, offering hard, fibrous objects. Stilgar selected four, handed them to Cheney. Fit these to Usul and the Sayadina. A voice lifted from the back of the troop. What of the water still? What of the liter Johns in their pack? I know your need, Farok, Stilgar said. He glanced at Jessica. She nodded. Broach one for those that need it, Stilgar said. Watermaster. Where is a watermaster? Ah, Shimum. Care for the measuring of what is needed. The necessity and no more. This water is the dower property of the Sayadina and will be repaid in the CH at field rates less pack fees. What is the repayment at field rates, Jessica asked. Ten for one, Stilgar said. But it's a wise rule, as you'll come to see, Stilgar said. A rustling of robes marked movement at the back of the troop as men turned to get the water. Stilgar held up a hand, and there was silence. As to Jameis, he said, I order the full ceremony. Jameis was our companion and brother of the Ichwan Bedouin. There shall be no turning away without the respect due one who proved our fortune by his Tahadi challenge. I invoke the right. At sunset, when the dark shall cover him. Paul, hearing these words, realized that he had plunged once more into the abyss. Blind time. There was no past occupying the future in his mind. Except. Except. He could still sense the green and black Atreides banner waving. Somewhere ahead, still see the jihad's bloody swords and fanatic legions. It will not be, he told himself. I cannot let it be. God created Arrakis to train the faithful. From the wisdom of Muad'Dib, by the Princess Irulan. In the stillness of the cavern, Jessica heard the scrape of sand on rock as people moved, 
the distant bird calls that Stilgar had said were the signals of his watchmen. The great plastic hood seals had been removed from the cave's opening. She could see the march of evening shadows across the lip of rock in front of her and the open basin beyond. She sensed the daylight leaving them, sensed it in the dry heat as well as the shadows. She knew her trained awareness soon would give her what these Fremen obviously had, the ability to sense even the slightest change in the air's moisture. How they had scurried to tighten their still suits when the cave was opened. Deep within the cave, someone began chanting, Ima Trava Okolo, Ikorenja Okolo. Jessica translated silently, These are ashes, and these are roots. The funeral ceremony for Jameis was beginning. She looked out at the Arakeen sunset, at the banked decks of color in the sky. Night was beginning to utter its shadows along the distant rocks and the dunes. Yet the heat persisted. Heat forced her thoughts onto water and the observed fact that this whole people could be trained to be thirsty only at given times. Thirst. She could remember moonlit waves on Caladan throwing white robes over rocks and the wind heavy with dampness. Now the breeze that fingered her robes seared the patches of exposed skin at cheeks and forehead. The new nose plugs irritated her, and she found herself overly conscious of the tube that trailed down across her face into the suit, recovering her breath's moisture. The suit itself was a sweat box. Your suit will be more comfortable when you've adjusted to a lower water content in your body, Stilgar had said. She knew he was right, but the knowledge made this moment no more comfortable. The unconscious preoccupation with water here weighed on her mind. No, she corrected herself. It was preoccupation with moisture. And that was a more subtle and profound matter. She heard approaching footsteps, turned to see Paul come out of the cave's depths, trailed by the elfin-faced Cheney. There's another thing, Jessica thought. Paul must be cautioned about their women. One of these desert women would not do as wife to a duke. As concubine, yes, but not as wife. Then she wondered at herself, thinking, Have I been infected with his schemes? And she saw how well she had been conditioned. I can think of the marital needs of royalty without once weighing my own concubinage. Yet, I was more than concubine. Mother. Paul stopped in front of her. Cheney stood at his elbow. Mother, do you know what they're doing back there? Jessica looked at the dark patch of his eyes, staring out from the hood. I think so. Cheney showed me because I'm supposed to see it and give my permission for the weighing of the water. Jessica looked at Cheney. They're recovering Jameis's water, Cheney said, and her thin voice came out nasal past the nose plugs. It's the rule. The flesh belongs to the person, but his water belongs to the tribe, except in the combat. They say the water's mine. Paul said. Jessica wondered why this should make her suddenly alert and cautious. Combat water belongs to the winner, Cheney said. It's because you have to fight in the open without still suits. The winner has to get his water back that he loses while fighting. I don't want his water, Paul muttered. He felt that he was a part of many images moving simultaneously in a fragmenting way that was disconcerting to the inner eye. He could not be certain what he would do, but of one thing he was positive. He did not want the water distilled out of Jameis's flesh. It's water, Cheney said. Jessica marveled at the way she said it. 
Water. So much meaning in a simple sound. A Bene Gesserit axiom came to Jessica's mind. Survival is the ability to swim in strange water. And Jessica thought, Paul and I, we must find the currents and patterns in these strange waters, if we are to survive. You will accept the water, Jessica said. She recognized the tone in her voice. She had used that same tone once with Leto, telling her lost duke that he would accept a large sum offered for his support in a questionable venture, because money maintained power for the Atreides. On Arrakis, water was money. She saw that clearly. Paul remained silent, knowing then that he would do as she ordered, not because she ordered it, but because her tone of voice had forced him to reevaluate. To refuse the water would be to break with accepted Fremen practice. Presently, Paul recalled the words of 467 Kalima in Yui's O.C. Bible. He said, From water does all life begin. Jessica stared at him. Where did he learn that quotation, she asked herself. He hasn't studied the mysteries. Thus it is spoken, Cheney said. Judishar Mantin. It is written in the Shanama that water was the first of all things created. For no reason she could explain. And this bothered her more than the sensation. Jessica suddenly shuddered. She turned away to hide her confusion and was just in time to see the sunset. A violent calamity of color spilled over the sky as the sun dipped beneath the horizon. It is time. The voice was Stilgar's ringing in the cavern. Jameis's weapon has been killed. Jameis has been called by him, by Shai Hulud who has ordained the phases for the moons that daily wane and, in the end, appear as bent and withered twigs. Stilgar's voice lowered. Thus it is with Jameis. Silence fell like a blanket on the cavern. Jessica saw the gray shadow movement of Stilgar like a ghost figure within the dark inner reaches. She glanced back at the basin, sensing the coolness. The friends of Jameis will approach, Stilgar said. Men moved behind Jessica, dropping a curtain across the opening. A single glow globe was lighted overhead far back in the cave. Its yellow glow picked out an inflowing of human figures. Jessica heard the rustling of the robes. Cheney took a step away, as though pulled by the light. Jessica bent close to Paul's ear, speaking in the family code. Follow their lead. Do as they do. It will be a simple ceremony to placate the shade of Jameis. It will be more than that, Paul thought. And he felt a wrenching sensation within his awareness as though he were trying to grasp something in motion and render it motionless. Cheney glided back to Jessica's side took her hand. Come, Sayadina. We must sit apart. Paul watched them move off into the shadows, leaving him alone. He felt abandoned. The men who had fixed the curtain came up beside him. Come, Uso. He allowed himself to be guided forward, to be pushed into a circle of people being formed around Stilgar who stood beneath the glow globe and beside a bundled, curving, and angular shape gathered beneath a robe on the rock floor. The troop crouched down at a gesture from Stilgar, their robes hissing the movement. Paul settled with them, watching Stilgar, noting the way the overhead globe made pits of his eyes and brightened the touch of green fabric at his neck. Paul shifted his attention to the robe-covered mound at Stilgar's feet, recognized the handle of a balisa protruding from the fabric. 
The spirit leaves the body's water when the first moon rises, still in tone. Thus it is spoken. When we see the first moon rise this night, whom will it summon? Jamus, the troop responded. Stilgar turned full circle on one heel, passing his gaze across the ring of faces. I was a friend of Jamus, he said. When the hawk flame stooped upon us at Hole in the Rock, it was Jamus pulled me to safety. He bent over the pile beside him, lifted away the robe. I take this robe as a friend of Jamus. Leader's right. He draped the robe over a shoulder, straightening. Now, Paul saw the contents of the mound exposed. The pale, glistening gray of a still suit, a battered leader john, a kerchief with a small book in its center, the bladeless handle of a chris knife, an empty sheath, a folded pack, a pericompass, a distrans, a thumper, a pile of fist-sized metallic hooks, an assortment of what looked like small rocks within a fold of cloth, a clump of bundled feathers, and the balisant exposed beside the folded pack. So Jameis played the balisant, Paul thought. The instrument reminded him of Gurney Halleck and all that was lost. Paul knew with his memory of the future in the past that some chance lines could produce a meeting with Halleck but the reunions were few and shadowed. They puzzled him. The uncertainty factor touched him with wonder. Does it mean that something I will do, that I may do, could destroy Gurney? Or bring him back to life? Or... Paul swallowed, shook his head. Again, Stilgar bent over the mound. For Jameis's woman and for the guards, he said. The small rocks and the book were taken into the folds of his robe. Leader's right, the troop intoned. The marker for Jameis's coffee service, Stilgar said, and he lifted a flat disc of green metal. That it shall be given to Usul in suitable ceremony when we return to the siege. Leader's right, the troop intoned. Lastly, he took the Chris knife handle and stood with it. For the funeral plane, he said. For the funeral plane, the troop responded. At her place in the circle across from Paul, Jessica nodded, recognizing the ancient source of the rite, and she thought the meeting between ignorance and knowledge, between brutality and culture... It begins in the dignity with which we treat our dead. She looked across at Paul, wondering, will he see it? Will he know what to do? We are friends of Jameis, Stilgar said. We are not wailing for our dead like a pack of garva. A gray-bearded man to Paul's left stood up. I was a friend of Jameis, he said. He crossed to the mound, lifted the distrans. When our water went below Minim at the siege of two birds, Jameis shared. The man returned to his place in the circle. Am I supposed to say I was a friend of Jameis? Paul wondered. Do they expect me to take something from that pile? He saw faces turn toward him, turn away. They do expect it. Another man across from Paul arose, went to the pack, and removed the paracompass. I was a friend of Jameis, he said. When the patrol caught us at bite of the cliff, and I was wounded, Jameis drew them off so the wounded could be saved. He returned to his place in the circle. Again the faces turned toward Paul, and he saw the expectancy in them, lowered his eyes. An elbow nudged him, and a voice hissed. Would you bring the destruction on us? How can I say I was his friend? Paul wondered. Another figure arose from the circle opposite Paul, 
and as the hooded face came into the light, he recognized his mother. She removed a kerchief from the mount. I was a friend of Jameis, she said. When the spirit of spirits within him saw the needs of truth, that spirit withdrew and spared my son. She returned to her place. And Paul recalled the scorn in his mother's voice as she had confronted him after the fight. How does it feel to be a killer? Again, he saw the faces turned toward him, felt the anger and fear in the troop. A passage his mother had once film-booked for him on the cult of the dead flickered through Paul's mind. He knew what he had to do. Slowly, Paul got to his feet. A sigh passed around the circle. Paul felt the diminishment of his self as he advanced into the center of the circle. It was as though he lost a fragment of himself and sought it here. He bent over the mound of belongings, lifted out the balancer. A string twanged softly as it struck against something in the pile. I was a friend of Jameis, Paul whispered. He felt tears burning his eyes, forced more volume into his voice. Jameis taught me that when you kill, you pay for it. I wish I'd known Jameis better. Blindly, he groped his way back to his place in the circle, sank to the rock floor. A voice hissed. He sheds tears. It was taken up around the ring. Usul gives moisture to the dead. He felt fingers touch his damp cheek, heard the awed whispers. Jessica, hearing the voices, felt the depth of the experience, realized what terrible inhibitions there must be against shedding tears. She focused on the words, He gives moisture to the dead. It was a gift to the shadow world. Tears. They would be sacred beyond a doubt. Nothing on this planet had so forcefully hammered into her the ultimate value of water. Not the water cellars, not the dried skins of the natives, not still suits or the rules of water discipline. Here there was a substance more precious than all others. It was life itself, and entwined all around with symbolism and ritual. Water. I touched his cheek, someone whispered. I felt the gift. At first, the fingers touching his face frightened Paul. He clutched the cold handle of the balisette, feeling the strings bite his palm. Then he saw the faces beyond the groping hands, the eyes wide and wondering. Presently, the hands withdrew. The funeral ceremony resumed. But now, there was a subtle space around Paul, a drawing back as the troop honored him by a respectful isolation. The ceremony ended with a low chant. Full moon calls thee, Shai Hulud shalt thou see, red the night, dusky sky, bloody death didst thou die. We pray to a moon, she is round. Luck with us will then abound. What we seek for shall be found in the land of solid ground. A bulging sack remained at Stilgar's feet. He crouched, placed his palms against it. Someone came up beside him, crouched at his elbow, and Paul recognized Cheney's face in the hood shadow. Jameis carried thirty-three liters and seven and three thirty-seconds drachms of the tribe's water, Cheney said. I bless it now, in the presence of a Sayadina. Ekeri Akairi, this is the water, Felicine Flasi of Paul Moadib. Kivi Akavi, never the more. Nakalas, Nakalas, to be measured and counted. Ukair An, 
by the heartbeats, Jean Jean Jean, of our friend, Jameis. In an abrupt and profound silence, Cheney turned, stared at Paul. Presently she said, Where I am flame, be thou the coals. Where I am dew, be thou the water. Bilal Kaifa intoned the troop. To Paul Muadib goes this portion, Cheney said. May he guard it for the tribe, preserving it against careless loss. May he be generous with it in time of need. May he pass it on in his time for the good of the tribe. Bilal Kaifa intoned the group. I must accept that water, Paul thought. Slowly he arose, made his way to Cheney's side. Stilgar stepped back to make room for him, took the balisa gently from his hand. Kneel, Cheney said. Paul knelt. She guided his hands to the water bag, held them against the resilient surface. With this water the tribe entrusts thee, she said. Jameis is gone from it. Take it in peace. She stood, pulling Paul up with her. Stilgar returned the balisa, extended a small pile of metal rings in one palm. Paul looked at them, seeing the different sizes, the way the light of the glow globe reflected off them. Cheney took the largest ring, held it on a finger. Thirty liters, she said. One by one, she took the others, showing each to Paul, counting them. Two liters. One liter. Seven water counters of one drachm each. One water counter of three thirty-seconds drachms. In all, thirty-three liters and seven and three thirty-seconds drachms. She held them up on her finger for Paul to see. Do you accept them? Stilgar asked. Paul swallowed, nodded. Yes? Later, Cheney said, I will show you how to tie them in a kerchief so they won't rattle and give you away when you need silence. She extended her hand. Will you hold them for me? Paul asked. Cheney turned a startled glance on Stilgar. He smiled, said, Paul Muadib, who is Usul, does not yet know our ways, Cheney. Hold his water counters without commitment until it's time to show him the manner of carrying them. She nodded, whipped a ribbon of cloth from beneath her robe, linked the rings onto it with an intricate over and under weaving, hesitated, then stuffed them into the sash beneath her robe. I missed something there, Paul thought. He sensed the feeling of humor around him, something bantering in it, and his mind linked up a prescient memory. Water counters offered to a woman. Courtship ritual. Water masters, Stilgar said. The troop arose in a hissing of robes. Two men stepped out, lifted the water bag. Stilgar took down the glow globe, led the way with it into the depths of the cave. Paul was pressed in behind Cheney, noted the buttery glow of light over rock walls, the way the shadows danced, and he felt the troop's lift of spirits contained in a hushed air of expectancy. Jessica, pulled into the end of the troop by eager hands, hemmed around by jostling bodies, suppressed a moment of panic. She had recognized fragments of the ritual, identified the shards of Chakobsa and Botani Jib in the words, and she knew the wild violence that could explode out of these seemingly simple moments. Jean, 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 she thought. Go, go, go. It was like a child's game that had lost all inhibition in adult hands. Stilgar stopped at a yellow rock wall. He pressed an outcropping and the wall swung silently away from him, opening along an irregular crack. 
He led the way through, past a dark honeycomb lattice that directed a cool wash of air across Paul when he passed it. Paul turned a questioning stare on Cheney, tugged her arm. That air felt damp, he said. Shh, she whispered. But a man behind them said, Plenty of moisture in the trap tonight. Jameis's way of telling us he's satisfied. Jessica passed through the secret door, heard it close behind. This book is continued on disc 14.